Hello, and welcome to Literary Merit, the show where we tell you what media has value. Spoiler alert, it's all of it. Also, spoiler alert, we will be discussing spoilers, so as usual, here's your warning. I'm Ashley. And I'm Alex. And I'll start by asking, what is new to you, Alex? So the big news in my life is that in since our last episode, my chapbook of poems was selected as a finalist in the Floating Bridge Press chapbook competition. So it will be coming out late September. Woohoo! That's so exciting, man! I was super stoked for you when I heard about that. I I... I think it still hasn't all the way set in, but I'm getting more and more excited <laughs> about it. The night it happened, it was like, I was like waiting for a response because I knew they were deliberating that night. <laughs> yeah. They, oh, God, that's the worst. social media person tweets about it. And so, uh-huh. like, I can't resist that. So I have to, like, sit and wait. Um, <laughs> And then luckily I also obsessively check my junk email because that's where the acceptance came from. Oh. And I was oh, like, that's man. cruel. That's a cruel joke. <laughs> that is, that's harsh. Oh man, yeah, but that so, is so, so cool. Yep, so The Myth of Man uh, will be coming out either late September or early October. The release party thing for it is going to be in October. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Awesome. Hey, can you tell us a little about it? Yeah, so it's sort of biographical poems, um, just about um, identity a little, well, actually, it's a lot about identity, but it's it's sort of told through the people in my life. It, it's it's the, titled The Myth of Man, so it sort of focuses on um, men in my life or relationships in my life. Um, but it also, in, in order to sort of talk about men, you have to talk, you have to talk about women also. So, um, (laughs) there's a lot about, uh, my mom, my grandmother, a little bit about my sister, but, um, there's a lot about like, yeah, people I've, I've dated and it's, uh, I want to just to sort of sum it up the, the editor who's going to be working on it with me. He, uh, he messaged me to congratulate me, and he I have to pull up his little quote that he sent me uh, for him describing it uh, sort of the tone of the of the of the book. And for those who don't know, a chat book is just basically a really short book. It's usually around thirty pages. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just how poetry works um, unless you're <laughs> like at a big publisher and you already have a, a really recognizable name. Yeah. People don't have a whole lot of patience for poetry on average. I cannot navigate this Twitter update. (laughs) I literally just accidentally put it on dark mode on my phone, and I'm kind of happy about it. (laughs) (laughs) Because I have it it that way on my computer, too. He said, uh, it was tender and funny and just enough vulgar. (laughs) That's a good review. And And I always forget that there's some, like, Vul- it's not necessarily vulgar, but it's like it's definitely like doesn't shy away from being sexual. But sure. Um, <laughs> but I I always forget that I put those parts in it because I don't focus on that as like the theme or anything. Uh huh. So I'm like, oh right, <laughs> there are, there's some pretty raunchy moments. There's some stuff in there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what are you, what's what's up with you? Well, um, you know, so it's been uh, longer than usual since we last recorded. Um because of schedules and stuff. So we've had a couple of weekends since we uh, we last talked. So I've, I've actually been really, really busy. I had my birthday, um, and it was <laughs> such a good birthday. Uh, I mentioned before um, that we were going to the Renaissance Fair for mm-hmm. my birthday, and it was the best thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> yeah, I saw it the was... pictures. Oh my god, it was so much fun. Like I can't even convey to you how happy I was. Like this is my you new totally favorite. You totally undersold your costume by the way. You said it was <laughs> oh, it's sort of just put together and sort of just vaguely renaissance themed. I was like, "No, that's pretty good. It was pretty good." <laughs> well, thank you. I yeah, I managed to pull that together in 2 weeks. So I'm pretty proud of my my turnaround on that, but it definitely needs some uh 
alterations before the next Renaissance Fair I'm going to at the end of July. <laughs> And that's going to be super, like, like we had been there for, like, 10 minutes, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to the other one, too. <laughs> like, I, I will go to every Renaissance Fair I can possibly go to. It was so much fun, and I got all kinds of cool trinkets and doodads because it was my birthday, and people kept buying me things. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, it was just the best thing ever. It was funny, though, um, it had been forecast to just rain all day and like thunderstorms all day and I was really kind of bummed about it I was like whatever I've got a cloak I've got an umbrella let's just (laughs) go for it and when we first got there (sighs) yep it just started pouring on us we were sitting there watching this comedy juggler show this guy was he was pretty funny he was he had a good patter um, and the whole time he's performing, it's just dumping buckets on us. And he's like, guys, I understand. Like, thanks for being out here with me. We're all getting wet. If you need to open your umbrella, I get it. Maybe go stand by the side so you're not blocking anybody. We'll just do this however we can. But after a couple hours, it actually cleared up and got really sunny which was super nice. I was actually watching the joust um, and the sun like started coming out and they're like sword fighting. And uh, it was cool. (laughs) It was really cool. (laughs) Um, And then I just got back um, just this weekend from uh, the Oregon coast. We were visiting my grandpa for Father's Day and that was super fun. Where where you were at? um, Where were you at again? Uh, Florence. Florence is awesome. It really is. It's a that's little gem the, there. That's where all the dunes are, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, you can like awesome. go out and rent dune buggies and stuff. Um, we were only there for like uh, Saturday evening and Sunday morning, um, mm-hmm. but we did get out on the beach and take a walk with the dogs and took some pretty pictures and it was nice. Nice to see Grandpa. But <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been busy, but it's been good busy. I think. Finally, next weekend, I actually get to just not do anything. So, nice. yeah, <laughs> I I had too. such a busy weekend with work, and like I have today and like the next couple days off. And normally, I'm a little bummed that I'm not working because I just like having something to do. But mm-hmm. I was just so worn out. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Sometimes it's nice to just. Take a breather, and uh, Will, my uh, my boyfriend, he's a teacher, and so he's actually on summer break now, which means he's going to be home a lot <laughs> more than <laughs> usual, which is going to be good because, like, with him working mostly evenings, basically I, I didn't get to see him at all. <laughs> like, yeah. the last several, you know, the last couple of months since I started this new job, at least, uh, He's just been gone <laughs> in the evening while I'm awake and comes home just in time to, like, tuck me into bed. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, he spent all day playing video games. So, lucky him. Did you <laughs> get to go to Pride at all? I didn't. I mean, like I said, I was uh, I was in Florence oh, right, right, right. this past weekend. See, you... I, I didn't have plans to... And I didn't necessarily want to, like, I mean, obviously, I always have, like, a little bit of a want to, but it, I, it's, like, big, crowded, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but then I was scheduled to work almost the entire weekend, like, nonstop. And so uh, uh, the fact that I couldn't go made me want to go more. <laughs> have you ever been to the um, Pride in the Park thing at, in Vancouver? I haven't been to that. Do you want, we should go to that, shouldn't we? I, I've been a couple of times. In fact, last year I actually tabled there um, with the funeral home. And it's just a really good time. It's a lot lower key than Portland yeah. Pride. It's just like a party in the park. Just like a nice festival. There's, you know, vendors and stuff all set up. There's bands playing all day. It's a, it's a lot more chill and just kind of hanging out. Yeah. No, I and, and it's also, it doesn't conflict with other holidays like... Yeah. Portland Pride. Yeah, that that uh... always that always really annoyed me is that Portland mm-hmm. Pride is always on Father's Day. Always. Yep. And so you have to choose between Well, they have to find some way to stick it to the patriarchy. See, That's just like the most direct route, isn't it? <laughs> but but it's also like every other big city does it the weekend before and I think Portland mm-hmm. does it to not compete with 
them, but at the same time, then they compete with Father's Day, and it's like, I don't know, it sucks. <laughs> but yeah, um, I think Vancouver Pride is, yeah, it's in July, so it's coming yeah. up in the next few weeks, so maybe we should make plans and go and do that. We should. We could do a live episode there. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be far too noisy, but right. yeah, we'll, it's a, on a Saturday, and Will is always um, in Vancouver on Saturdays for work, so I can just hitch a ride up there, and nice. we can hang. Cool. Yeah, we'll have yeah. to figure that out. Definitely. Well, any other uh, any other news we want to get around to sharing? Um, I think that's it for news. Well, then, we might as well get into the topic today, which is... Quentin Tarantino's 2009 film, *Inglorious Bastards*. An eight-year-old movie. <laughs> oh my God! Don't tell me that. I remember when this movie was being advertised because it was um, right when I had graduated high school. Um, I was on a trip in England. Um, my parents took my brother and I to. Uh, to England for my, you know, graduation present sort of thing. And Mm -hmm. uh, I saw posters, like, advertisements for it all over, like, the underground in London, but the posters didn't have the title on it because they couldn't write that on a poster. (laughs) So it's just, like, the new film from Quentin Tarantino, and it was, like, Brad Pitt's face, and it's like, but what's (laughs) it called, though? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I love this movie, but... I love every single Quentin Tarantino <laughs> movie, so it's not saying a whole lot. I haven't seen as many of his movies as I probably should have. I mean, there's no, obviously, there's no, you know, code that dictates what we have to watch, but... Yeah, but um, we'll fix that, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> One of my, this is going to sound so stupid. One of my favorite things he's done is From Dusk Till Dawn. Yeah, that's, well, like, I only find that funny because he didn't really have much to do with it. Like, he's in it, he but that's it. a Robert Rodriguez movie. Oh, I guess he wrote it, but it's a yeah. Robert Rodriguez movie through and through. Like, Oh, yeah, it's... but they're, they're so closely tied in, in their styles. Yeah, but it was, I guess, you know, Robert Rodriguez is like the Mexican-American Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> well, now I, just get... talk, now I just want to talk about Robert Rodriguez movies. <laughs> Well, we'll do that another time because, boy, is that a fascinating canon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but to take it take it back to Tarantino. Um, so, I guess, I mean, if you're listening to this, I hope that you have seen this movie. If you haven't, what's your problem? Uh, <laughs> but as a quick little sort of summary of the film, it takes place uh, it, during World War II. We've got a sort of broad cast of characters, including um, Aldo Rain, played by Brad Pitt, who is the commander of this uh, super secret squadron of revenge-seeking Jews uh, from the American military who are going out on a guerrilla mission to instill fear within the Nazi ranks by just scalping a whole bunch of Nazis and spreading scary stories about themselves. Uh, We've got Shoshana Dreyfus, played by Melanie Laurent, who is dear to my heart. I love her a lot. <laughs> and this and she, this this role is just so spectacular. She is incredible. She's incredible. So Shoshana, she is this um, young Jewish woman who has uh, run away after the murder of her family when they were being sheltered by a French family of farmers, dairy farmers. Um, that she was the intro only one to, to the escape. Film, though, is like. Yeah, we'll talk about that opening scene. Okay, we have. (laughs) We'll talk about it. But Shoshana, she's on the run. She's hiding in Paris, um, running a movie theater um, under the name Emmanuel Mimieu. And uh, these two sort of stories converge because um, both of the the bastards, as the squadron are called, and Shoshana individually hatch a plan to uh, take down the Nazi brass at the premiere of the new propaganda film. Uh, God, what is the film called? Now I'm blanking. Oh, I, I don't know. Um, I... I'm gonna look it up because I feel bad. I well, and look, it's I, probably I remember it. really, a really good title for a generic propaganda film. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure I can't remember because it's just like, yep, that's a Nazi film. 
Um, <laughs> oh, it's the sniper thing. Yeah, the sniper the that uh, uh, Zoller, Frederick Zoller, is starring is in. Like the tower or something like that? Well, he's up in a tower. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> seeing if any of those will clue us in <laughs> the title of it. Nation's Pride. That's why we couldn't think of the name, because it sounds like every single Nazi propaganda film ever made. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there's just a lot of... I mean, it's a Tarantino movie, so we've got a lot of characters leading very interesting lives that all intertwine in spectacular fashion. And uh, it's there's a, there's a lot to be said about this movie. What What are your initial sort of inclinations to to talk about i i almost feel like everybody in hollywood wanted to be in this movie he got a lot of good people i mean this was sort of the breakout role for christoph waltz who just blows my mind right he i mean this basically started his career in in america it did, yeah. He was a yeah, working actor in Germany, but he, yeah, he was the perfect... See, that's Tarantino's... One of Tarantino's many gifts is just incredible casting. He gets the right cast, and he knows exactly what to do with them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then it has a, people that you wouldn't even necessarily put in... Because it's not, it's not a comedy, for sure, but it's not it's... unfunny. I don't even know what to call it because it is. It's very funny. Um, it's yeah. certainly not like a wartime drama. I <laughs> it's a Tarantino movie. Yeah, and, and it's movie. not. It's not satire either. Yeah. No. It's. It's. I mean, it's like his other films in that sort of tone. Yeah. Whatever it is. But we've got um, I Eli Roth, who is not Eli usually an Roth. actor. Doesn't he usually he's write? He's so perfect, though, as Donnie Donowitz. He's so... Yeah. And then we have another writer slash sometimes actor is... Um... Uh, B.J. Novak? Yeah, B.J. Novak. So what yeah. odd choices... To, like, I don't know. Like, yeah, it's just... I mean, we, we've got some really interesting casting, too. We've got a cameo from Mike Myers. That is my favorite moment. It, it, it's not, like, a good moment, necessarily. <laughs> but it's so, like... It's just out of left field, and it yeah. works. Like, he even, does a perfectly gonna, decent job. Complete, if you recognize who he is, because he, I think that he's in some prosthetics. Um, oh, yeah, he's wearing some old man makeup for sure. Yeah, so if you recognize him, it completely takes you out of the moment for a little bit, uh -huh. which is kind of cool, because you're like, oh, I haven't seen Mike Myers in a minute. Yeah, <laughs> um, there he is. And then, or if you don't recognize him, you're just like, okay, this is an old colonel guy. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, Speaking of that scene, we've got Michael Fassbender, who's always good. Yeah, I was actually talking about uh, prepping for this episode with some coworkers, and one of my coworkers, he's he's a movie buff, and we were talking about Inglorious Bastards, and he, he was like, "This is like the movie that made uh, him love Michael Fassbender because." Um, oh, now I'm forgetting. I just, you know, when you start talking and then you forget what you were talking about. Yes, <laughs> happens a lot. Oh boy. Yeah, he just he just liked the scene uh, at the bar with with Fastbender. Fastbender's in that scene, right? Yeah, yeah, he's the one yeah. who gives the game away. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, so he, he just he just fell in love with him and, and at that in that. Scene yeah, it's in... a. There's so much tension in that scene. We've got Diane Kruger um, in that scene as uh, Bridget von Hammersmark. Also, an amazing like the women in this movie seriously steal the show for me. They do. They're so, so, so good. The men are great, but they're just amazing. Yeah, and and I mean, probably my favorite Brad Pitt role ever is Aldo Rain. <laughs> well, so you mentioned the tension in that bar scene. So let's talk about like some of the tensions in this movie. I was also starting to talk about that first scene. So should we start with the first scene? Sure, and actually that's a great jumping off point for a, a broader topic I wanted to get to, which is this, it, I mean, because it's a, it's a film about film, but it's even more so, you know, maybe in a, in a broader way, a um, film about performance. And boy, oh. is that first scene a performance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone is performing the entire time, and it's 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 remarkable, just the sort of, 
pageant that's being put yeah, on. Yeah, it's like it's like a fast paced chess match of acting. And on you both, just know, on, Londa. On both, on both a, 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 I think it's uh, didactic. Is that the film term where it's in in film? Um, yeah. Uh, in both in the film and then the actors portraying the characters who are acting, you know? Yeah. I mean, and you, but the thing is, like, Londa is so good and so terrifying because you know that he knows he's going to win. This is a chess match, and he is a chess grandmaster. Like, there is no yeah. way he is coming out of this without winning. And it's well, so he knows he, he He knows they're there. Yeah, he and just... even 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 if they weren't there for some for some reason that he would you know he couldn't foresee, which he I'm sure he could foresee a lot. Mm-hmm. Like he's he's gonna end up victorious just because he'd probably just beat up the guy anyway. Yeah, he could. He's he's in control a hundred percent of the time. He <laughs> he's in control, and it's it's. I mean, that's it, and it's just such a testament to Valtz's performance there. Like he's so pleasant the whole time and it is the scariest thing there's also that tension of the the thin floor floorboards like and that's like the <sighs> only thing separating the 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 jewish people hiding beneath that and it's like directly yeah the dreyfuses yeah uh, it's so scary uh i mean just everything that londa does in that scene i i, I found this fantastic analysis of the movie which i'm definitely going to share in the episode notes um it's it's a sort of a critical analysis. Um, I found it on RogerEbert.com, but it's mm-hmm. uh, Jim Emerson, who's one of the editors on RogerEbert.com, and he's talking about there's this, you know, there's that sort of comical moment where Londa brings out his pipe, and it's just that big honk in Sherlock Holmes' pipe, yeah. um, and you know, people feel like it's sort of a an overcompensation joke or something, mm-hmm. but. Um, this uh, reviewer sort of explains it as just another preemptive move on Londa's part, kind of saying like, yeah, I knew that you smoked a pipe, so I brought a pipe too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yep. just one of yep. those moments yes. where he's asserting his control of the situation. And that, I mean, and that almost feels very like, not not necessarily stereotypically Nazi, but like... You know what I'm saying? Like it's just such a the the the, the dominating aspect of that is just so what you would yeah, expect. He's, but and but it's always it, it's funny that you said that because yeah, it, he's you know, you you sort of see that as being a facet of the 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 mythology of the Nazi, you know, the the fascist sort of control, but still the the character of Londa manages you, to surprise you in the way that he asserts his control because he's not he ne- he doesn't yell he doesn't yell yeah. once in this movie he doesn't order anybody to do anything at any point he's just in charge and he knows yeah. it mm-hmm, oh mm-hmm. he's so scary <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah i mean this this you know beyond that like this movie is full of people performing you know the bastards they're playing the role of this terrifying boogeyman in order to sort of decrease morale they're basically living propaganda even though they themselves i'm sure are terrified because they're jews yeah (laughs) and 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 this movie is just all it's full of it's about the making of a propaganda film yeah and is it it's in itself a, a sort of anti-nazi propaganda film too because it's about killing hitler yeah oh boy and yeah i want i want to get around to that i've got some other things to say on this topic first but there's that's a really interesting one there uh but we've got shoshana who's basically living her life as a performance pretending to be emmanuel mimu yeah you've got um her dating or not dating but an actor who's sort of pursuing her and he's an actor in the movie and in but he's yeah, yeah but he's also a soldier but he's pretending yes. to not be a, the soldier that he is because yeah. he doesn't want people to know and <laughs> you've got <laughs> um bridget von hammersmark who is an actress who is actually a spy right we, <laughs> like everyone you've got archie hickox who is a film critic pretending to be a soldier like he's not you know he's really just a film critic but he, here he is being a soldier instead and like everybody is putting on performances all the time in this movie and it is fascinating 
Yeah, and even like, I wouldn't say that uh, Brad Pitt's necessarily the best actor because in this film, because it's hard to sort of <laughs> say that about any movie. But his he has a, a certain caliber about him, um, mm-hmm. and then his character has to pretend to be somebody else when they go to the theater, and he's just <laughs> terrible. He's terrible. It's the funniest scene. It's what act, funniest he tries scene. to have an Italian? He's he tries to pull, pass off as Italian, yeah. right? Yeah, he doesn't even try. He doesn't. <laughs> Buongiorno. Buongiorno. <is> a... Buongiorno. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the other two guys are making fools of themselves, but at yeah. least they're attempting it. But oh god, that's a funny scene, and it's also just. So, like, underneath, it's so scary because there's Londa, and you know that he knows what's up. He's just not saying anything yet because he's got control of the situation. He's like, mm, yep, here it is, because the whole time, of course, because he's performing, too. He's just yeah. waiting for his opportunity to sell the Nazis out so that he can go retire in Nantucket and <laughs> get out of the war. Like, so here he is. He's like, aha, okay, here they are. I've found them. I just have to wait for my opportunity to strike a deal. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. It's so good. Uh, on, though, to, to, to get back to that, that thing I put a pin in earlier, <laughs> it is so fascinating to me. Okay, so here we are, this climactic scene. We're watching the Nazis, watching Nation's Pride, mm-hmm. in which... A Nazi soldier is pop, 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 gunning down uh, allied soldiers through just the entirety. Like, that's the whole movie. It's just this one guy shooting guys the whole time. (laughs) And and we're supposed to be like, ah, these terrible people, like, watching this movie about this sniper just killing people. And then just a few minutes later, here we are watching a movie in which allied soldiers are gunning down and burning alive Nazis, and here we are cheering and whooping the same way that those Nazis were. And it's really fascinating to me that there is that juxtaposition. And it's subtle, I think. I I don't know that everyone is necessarily going to come to that conclusion. But I think as much as people perceive Tarantino as sort of glorifying violence, he tempers it a lot with this sort of self-aware criticism. Yeah. Um, that's especially prevalent, I think, in uh, The Hateful Eight, which you need to see. I know. I was. It's not on Netflix anymore, on Instant. I think it was for a little while. Oh, it's no. not there anymore. Um, that sucks. Yeah, you got to find that. We got to talk about it because I believe that's the thesis of that whole movie. Yeah. Um, but I definitely see shades of that in Inglorious Bastards. And another interesting thing, even though there's this whole, like, attempt to get revenge for the jewish people by depicting this horrifying death for hitler and his his top people like there's Mm -hmm. also small little i'm not sure if they're necessarily attempts to humanize him or just humiliate him because he he's signed he's kind of crude in in some in some parts Mm -hmm. actually in every part of this movie he's sort of this like crude temperamental um like, yeah, he, yeah, he appears very few times on screen. Um, but, they, yeah, and, and here, you know, just another layer of the sort of performance. Uh, he is so much more angry about this propaganda thing that's being spread through the ranks, the idea of these the bastards and how scary they are. That's the bigger problem in his eyes than any, like, actual military defeat. Yeah, he's like, oh, we're fine. It's just these guys. <laughs> these guys are ruining everything. Uh, the propaganda is the much more powerful thing at work. Yeah, which I don't know enough about history, but I feel like that could be true because he, he, you know, he's an artist and I, he was up very much so about his image and, um, well, propaganda was a, just everywhere yeah. in World yeah. War II. It was a well, huge and, yeah. deal. And like, if you're that so focused on terrifying people to listen to you and like your charisma, I'm sure. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's you'd be really worried it was about a cult of personality. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of propaganda, I was just today listening to um, this really great episode of... Um, do you know the podcast, You Must Remember This? No, I don't. 
It is so good. It's this podcast um, about the secret and or forgotten histories of Hollywood uh, in the last 100 years. Wrong. And um, it's super duper duper good. It's hosted by Karina Longworth. And um, I cannot recommend it highly enough. I've been working my way through the archives. So this episode that I listened to today is fairly old, but it's mm-hmm. um, part of her Star Wars series about Hollywood stars during the war. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the episode was on Walt Disney and oh. sort of the period in which his studio was basically being sold out to the United States government to make yeah. propaganda films. Yep, mm-hmm. yep. yep. <laughs> I remember watching some of those in school, yeah. Yeah, uh, Der Fuhrer's Face, that's the most famous one. And there's also one where it's, like, uh, about vaccinations. Yeah, I mean, they did one about income taxes, they did. (laughs) So, um, but it's just fascinating, you know, that the, you know, the United States government was obviously participating in this as well. Um, But, yeah, like, a big portion of of Inglorious Bastards is about um, German propaganda films, yeah. you know, there, Lenny Riefenstahl is referenced. Like, there's, I mean, Goebbels is a maybe more present character than Hitler himself. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's very much about propaganda, mm-hmm. much more so than it is about battle. Yeah. Um, so there's a moment that I really want to talk about um, because oh. it's probably... Uh, I don't know. I, I just have to talk about it. So it's the the uh, montage where Shoshana is prepping her film and the sabotage. Yeah. And it, the song playing above is David David Bowie. Yes. <laughs> That's another one of Tarantino's talents, <laughs> picking the perfect soundtrack. I, I love that song so much. Like, everybody has, like, one David Bowie song that really got them hooked. And that's the song for me, is uh, Cat People. Yeah. Which is such yeah, a weird it's title. A great choi- <laughs> it is for a, a song. Well, it's Bowie. Right. <laughs> it's Bowie, man. But uh, Tarantino is fantastic at picking soundtracks. Like, that, I think, is, you know, one of his highest talents, is just picking the right music. It's kind of remarkable. And I think that's the only song in the movie that's that's uh out of its time right i don't know i couldn't want to say i honestly i don't know for sure but i think so possibly um but i wouldn't be shocked if he snuck some other stuff in there yeah Mm -hmm. even if they're just instrumental versions or something yeah and and i mean because a lot of it is that sort of cinemagraphic score which is um honestly fairly rare in his films you know he he especially previous to Inglorious Bastards didn't necessarily go in for the whole like musical score thing. He, he well, I think much... that's what sort of uh, highlights those really terrifying moments. Is like we're we're in this, you know. We're not there's there's not uh, part something taking us out of that moment where we're we're terrified with the characters. Yeah. Whereas the montage of Shoshana setting up, you're like. You want to get pumped with her. You want to be ready to burn these people alive. So he's like, play yeah. David Bowie. <laughs> That's a, yeah. interesting choice, and it but it definitely works. Uh, yeah, I mean, and that's you know that's a great scene too because you know that's her preparing to play this role. Yeah. You know, that's just another layer of performance. It's you know Shoshana playing the character of Jewish vengeance. Right. And she there's so many, so many little details that we could talk about, like the fact that she gives her speech in English. Yeah. Yeah. And then her lover as well. That is really interesting. I I always forget about her lover. Oh, Marcel. Yeah. Yeah. The the projectionist Marcel. Yeah. He's uh, he has a really interesting character. Yeah. It is kind of a shame that he's not given more screen time, but I get why he's not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and still, Tarantino manages to sort of paint a, a, a picture of this guy. Like, he really does feel like a person, even though he only gets a, you know, a few paltry minutes of screen time. Well, yeah, and we want we want them to be be happy because of, you know, what she's been through and what they're both fighting against and also 
like what there he's being compared to with the other guy who's trying to woo her who's just terrible he is oh my god frederick Soler. daniel Bruhl does such a great job in that role he's i think we've talked about him he's before. so what good was at he playing that recently what was he in recently that we were he was about? in uh age of ultron oh right <laughs> yeah not as good a role <laughs> not as good a role in that one but um he does such a good job in in inglorious bastards of playing just like the nice guy taken to its extreme you know yeah, he's like where, come where on like i'm violent. cool i'm chill yeah, yeah mm-hmm. it's disgusting how yeah. he you know has this expectation uh you know what she owes him and he's like i'm being nice to you so yeah. come on <laughs> Ugh. <sighs> So yucky, so so right, so yucky. Right. To see, especially just to see that turn in him where he lets it down, you know. And that's another performance. Oh my right. god! Oh my. Like, <laughs> and, and, yeah, it's just, it's just constant. It's constant. And I'm also Everyone is of, always performing. Yeah, I'm also thinking of that dinner he, he that they have with um, some mm. of the higher ups. Yeah, where with, she's, with she's Goebbels again. and with Londa. Yeah, yeah, where she's again like putting like she she has to hide herself. You know, I gotta say, that is probably my favorite, most impactful moment of the whole movie when Londa, right after Londa leaves, Shoshana is left alone and she finally can breathe and cry. And it's yeah. just the most heartbreaking, terrifying moment where she's holding it together with every ounce of her being. And as soon as she's alone, she's just broken. Like, that was just the most horrific, terrifying experience she's ever had since the day her family died. Yeah. Ugh. The more we the more we talk about this, the more I'm like, Tarantino did this. <laughs> but here's the thing, man. I could talk this way about all of his movies, yeah. and mm-hmm. I promise you, in time, I will. This will happen on this show. <laughs> well, I think, I think we'll get there. One is the one that that can probably catch the widest audience. I agree. I of absolutely agree. Seen, this has the broadest appeal, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, of course, my favorites of his are the ones with the narrowest <laughs> appeal. But <laughs> well, I mean, again, I'm on me, the next me, level. Me with from Tarantino dusk till dawn, which is like universally thought of as just stupid. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. Dusk till dawn. Try Jackie Brown. No one's even seen Jackie Brown. <laughs> what if my coworker mentioned that one, and and he was like, "Oh, it's so good." <laughs> it is honestly. I think that's my favorite. And we're gonna have to talk about it but that is for another day because y'all <laughs> gotta see it yeah it's it's great um but no yeah you're right this this definitely has the broadest appeal. and that's the interesting thing about tarantino because his movies seem to sort of you know he he picks some genre usually a sort of a camp genre and plays in it and explores it and sometimes he'll mash it up but like world war ii war movies like that's that's the biggest, broadest genre, I think, that he has yeah. mm-hmm. sort of pursued at, at any point. You know, he's yeah. got Jackie Brown, which is riffing on black exploitation films. You've got the crime films, uh, Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs. You've got the Westerns. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got the sort of kung fu slash anime thing going on in Kill Bill. Uh, but World War Two movies, like that's at least in America, the one that really just sort of catches everybody. This is sort of a side note, but um, it it made me think of the new. Um, oh gosh, I'm I'm so bad with names. Uh, uh, he did um, Interstellar and Batman. Oh. Um... Oh no, you you're rubbing off on me. I can't. <laughs> Just, I, I can think second, of the I'll composer for his films, but I can't no, think of it's, him. <laughs> it's Christopher Nolan. Thank you, Christopher Nolan's new movie, which is a war movie in World War Two. Oh, Dunkirk. 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 That looks so good. See, I don't know what to expect because I was I was also talking about my co or talking with my coworkers about this. I was like, is there some sort of like hidden twist or because it seems so out of the blue, similar to choosing a, a, a war movie for, for Tarantino, like, why would this director choose this genre? You know? Yeah. And I, I had to do a little research on it to figure out why, and they're, they're sort of doing this, like, 
different perspectives thing in the in the movie but still i'm like what what's gonna draw me in because i'm not necessarily the the person that watches war movies you know i'm not either but if chris nolan did it i'm gonna see it i mean i think the trailers look really good and it's got a lot of actors in it that i love if it wasn't directed by chris nolan i might not be interested but yeah i think you're right since he is directing it i think that's a good indicator that there's something at something work waiting for that's us. not yeah. necessarily present in every war film. Yeah. Uh, and that thing is called Harry Styles. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? Is he in that movie? Harry Styles is in it. Yes. Oh my goodness. I hope he's singing Sign of the Times because I'm obsessed with that song. <laughs> you know, I kind of doubt he will. <laughs> but wouldn't that be great? Like, there's just this beautiful yeah. war war montage of like people getting shot and then it's just like sign of the times <laughs> that would be different See, that would sure. be that would be way more tarantino <laughs> yeah but i mean you know in addition to mr styles we've got um kenneth brana we've got killian murphy yep, like yep. these are these are good people a couple of his usuals um yeah uh, we got uh tom hardy Oh. The party's in it. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we get back to Tarantino? <laughs> um, this isn't this isn't an episode about Mr. Nolan as much right, as I like right. him. We'll we'll have we'll have other time to talk about him. I'm sure. Oh yeah. So so if we're, I I can sort of branch off into the like, it, it's almost tied to the performance thing, but it's almost like, uh, the direct direction and writing choices so the the choices to change various aspects of what really happened in order to make a certain effect Mm -hmm. on the audience so one tiny little thing is that the bastards were british not american (laughs) which i don't i don't know if that would have made a huge difference on the audience if they would have just made them british i i wonder um, I, th- I think it actually probably had to do with who he could have cast. Because I I don't know if he could have gotten what he wanted as a director out of mm-hmm. audiences seeing their, their sort of usual British leads, you know? Yeah, and well, honestly, I'm just not... I, I'm not sure Tarantino could direct a film from a British perspective. Oh, yeah, they, he would probably upset them. <laughs> I just, yeah, I just don't know that he's got it in him. I, I think yeah. that stylistically, he's so tied up in Americana. Yeah, I think exactly. in order mm-hmm. to tell that story, it had to be from an American point of view. There wasn't, it, it he couldn't have done it, I don't think, that, that way. But at the same time, it's like, I almost feel like there were two other directors, or at least one other director with the Shoshana story, because it's like, that's such a different storyline for him and for almost all of hollywood hollywood watch doesn't jackie like do... brown watch <laughs> hollywood, jackie brown <laughs> hollywood, hollywood doesn't do a foreign films <laughs> mm. and or especially if there's subtitles like hollywood shies away from subtitles mm. and i know that because but we as viewers often do yeah shoshana though is his sort of interesting take i think on the 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 damsel you know that's the the closest he's ever had to a damsel character and she's really tarantinoed up as a damsel she's you know scaring people with baseball bats or whatever and (laughs) you know like generally kicking ass um but you know then she puts on her vampy red dress and her veil and Uh. she slinks around god she's so incredible (laughs) i want to be her (laughs) she's my she is my role model by the way melanie laurent in everything i do i wish to be melanie laurent (laughs) she's incredible but yeah i mean that's you know there's that that's a common trope i think in especially older war films um which i think tarantino is drawing on much more than the current sort of saving private ryan type fare um Mm -hmm. You know, the she's the sort of, I don't know, Marlena Dietrich character, yeah. if yeah. you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's definitely, but as far as um, female perspectives go, uh, there is a conversation to be had involving Jackie Brown. Um, that, that movie 
just knocks my socks off that 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 is a story that he is choosing to tell like it's remarkable um but the i i see some parallels some echoes of Jackie mm-hmm. Brown in Shoshana and i there are a couple other changes that were made i mean obviously hitler wasn't burned to death <laughs> in a theater Gunned down with a machine gun to the face <laughs> right <laughs> um and i i mean we could talk them for a, like 10 podcast episodes just about why that was chosen uh as to, yeah as to there's a sort of conclusion there's a lot to unpack there i think the sort of simplest way to look at it the simplest way to put it is that you know this is a this is a film about performance this is a film about films and that is the ending that that movie needed to have you know no you know quiet sad pathetic ending in a bunker like this is blaze of glory we won that's that's how this movie had i mean because I mean, frankly, I mean, I guess, you know, the whole movie is leading up to this. Like, yeah, can yeah. you imagine if Operation Kino just didn't work at all? <laughs> yeah. And it, it's just a total, it's revenge for an entire group of people. And it's revenge for Shoshana on multiple levels, losing her family, yeah. losing her lover, losing herself. You know, she had to become somebody completely different in order to do it. Um, mm-hmm. So it, I will say, though, yeah. it's possible that Marcel didn't die. If anyone made it out alive, it's Marcel. He, he shot, might have been he? able to get out. No, I don't think he got shot. Yeah, he I lit think... the silver nitrate film, and then that was it. That's all you saw of him. I need to rewatch it, because I swear um, the guy who's in love with her shot him. No, he shot Shoshana. Oh, right, right. He right. comes into the projection booth. You're right, sorry. Um, I should have watched and it, she but shoots I, for, him. I, forgot we were, I forgot we were recording today, so I was going to watch it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Well, it's okay. Yeah, no, Marcel may have made it out alive, because I think the plan was for the both of them to make it out alive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She was going to set the final reel, leave, and Marcel was going to light it up and leave, and they would lock everybody in. Yeah. Um, and that just didn't work out for Shoshana, but I think Marcel probably did make it out. So good for Marcel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could talk a little bit about like it, it being sort of a revenge fantasy, and that's almost like Tarantino's... Because don't people sort of name Hateful Eight, Inglorious Bastards? At least I've heard it referred, heard his last three films referred to as sort of like the revenge trilogy. They're all sort yeah, of... Yeah, even though, I mean, I, you know, I get that sort of characterization. At the yeah. same time, though, Kill Bill is far more a revenge movie than The Hateful Eight Well, is. yeah, you can sort of see the sort of power trip revenge. Uh, yeah, it is. Twisting, it's a revenge film. Twisting I, roles I mean, in all of his stuff, I would say, probably. Yeah. If anything, like, it, Hateful Eight's just really not very much of a revenge film. I mean, it's kind of, but it's in a very small way, and I'd say it's not the focus of the movie at all. Yeah. There's a lot more going on, whereas, Mm -hmm. you know, Inglorious Bastards and especially Django Unchained are, you know, films of people fighting back against an institution that has taken advantage of them. Yeah. And I I remember having conversations about Tarantino and both Inglorious Bastards and Django with my ex. And we we sort of talked about how cool it would be if the, the next one that Tarantino made would be like um, a queer rights sort of movie where it's like all the trans women of color, like, <laughs> you know, like t- Stonewall and like the uh, uprising and, and how cool that would be to actually see what went on. The, and... That's so funny that you say that because what I had kind of crossed my fingers for and halfway anticipated was, I mean, okay, so what what are the, you know, sort of historical racial atrocities that America has been tied to? We've got World War II, we've mm-hmm. got the transatlantic slave trade, 
And the yep. Native American genocide. Oh, that would be one too, yeah. But nobody's going to make a movie about Native American genocide. I was like, oh man, well, is he going to do it? Because... Is he going to do it? No, he didn't. Because do it. It, A, it's way worse than the history books say. Which I think oh, would probably draw him to making that movie. <laughs> but yeah, I had hoped. Right. But then to, 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 to sort of show white people doing that, which is what happened. Mm-hmm. Well, but he, he did, know. you know, make Django. Yeah, but it's... That's white people. That is white people, <laughs> but we, 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 we do talk about that a little bit more. You know? Yeah, we do. We don't want to talk about it. We don't even remember. Thanks, Last of the Mohicans, for helping people pretend that Native Americans just disappeared into the mist. <laughs> this is a This is a... A pet grievance of mine, and it's weird because it has nothing to do with me personally, but I just, I, I'm astounded at the ignorance people have about uh, Native Americans and the history of yeah the United States government. Just, uh, but so I had hoped and I had thought like it made so much sense and it made chronological sense because we've got World War II, we go further back, transatlantic slavery, we go further back, but no. See, no, no, and no. I think it's probably for the best that he doesn't make these two movies that we're imagining. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be yeah. cool because we like his style. But if we had like a trans woman of color direct a Varenge movie about Stonewall and a Native American filmmaker make a revenge movie about like, it's never going to yeah. happen because of the current state of Hollywood. But how amazing would that Those be? Those would be the ideal people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and at least Tarantino has made a career sort of insinuating himself and ingratiating himself in the African American community. You know, that's yeah. sort of been a, a, a an aim of his to portray and interact with um, African American culture. Um, but yeah, not 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 so much Native American <laughs> culture. <laughs> yeah, I would I I would don't know if I would trust him. Uh with with queer culture either i mean considering what we've gotten so far from people with best intentions oh gosh does he even have a single queer character oh god like i'm thinking back i'm not certain there is pseudo lesbian kisses in kill bill that's probably the only thing i can imagine there being no no i kind of got a gay vibe from uh Oren Ishii's French, like, assistant. <laughs> but that's <laughs> nothing. That's just me kind of having my gaydar beep. Uh, but no, I don't think there is anything gay yeah. in any of his films. Wow. Really? Really, Quentin? No gays at all? Well, I, mean, I mean, like, in the early ones, it's, it's not a surprise. I mean, but... we are talking about a nine-year-old movie <laughs> that came out in 2007. And that was, I yeah, mean, but he's it, always been it, about it, sort of pushing boundaries I know, and I know. ruffling and it feathers. Seems like, it seems like it was not long ago, especially to us, but like a lot's changed. But yeah, I, again, I would love to see it. I don't know if I want him to touch it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he, I'd say some rep- representation would be nice. You know, maybe it's not his story to tell, but he'd at least, at least throw in some queer characters. It's kind of a shock to me that he didn't. I'm trying to think if there's anybody gay in, like, Jackie Brown or... No. God, really? All right, well, he hasn't done that. Huh. <laughs> At least he's he's concerned himself with telling important stories about women. Um, and I think he's done a good job of that. Yeah, and I'm not someone to speak on if he's shown uh, black people in... In, in the way they need him to show them. Um, but they're at least always there. Yes. In his movies. Yeah, pretty much always. Yeah. I, I mean, I, even, even in, even in Inglorious Bastards, you know, there's mm-hmm. a black man and like, uh, people like to say there were, there's no, like barely any black people in Europe, but they're there, you know? <laughs> yeah, they're absolutely So it's good, there. it's absolutely. good that he included somebody. Yeah, I think in Reservoir Dogs, everyone is white. But from Pulp Fiction on, yeah. he does have black characters in all of his films. 
if at very least just Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> if, then, I feel like, if nobody I feel like else, he's lot. got it's Sam. Like, there's probably a percentage of Hollywood movies where he's the only black character. Yeah, well, and man, he and Tarantino, they they go all the way back, just yeah. about. Oh, I, I just sort of, it's it's not related at all, but uh, uh, Kingsman, I'm just realizing now, has a bit of a Tarantino vibe. Definitely some flavors, yeah. <laughs> some shades <laughs> of Tarantino in that one. I can see that. It's like, it's like James Bond meets Tarantino a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Which, I mean would would be in in Tarantino's wheelhouse to sit, sort of take that campy genre and and twist it. Yeah, the spy movie. I mean, it's yeah, it's just a hop skip and a jump away from his sort of I mean, what he had going on in Kill Bill. Right? Yeah. You know, we it's the the sort of international crime syndicate assassin thing. That's <laughs> it's it's spy adjacent for sure. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <sighs> And that sort of like getting what you finally deserve comes up with Shoshana, who's had to escape, and she even though she ultimately dies, she mm-hmm. she she wins the biggest win. She wins. <laughs> she wins. She, she wins for her people. She wins for for herself. She wins for the world. Her family. <laughs> yeah, she she's she does it, and it's honestly the biggest tragedy. Is it no one will ever know? Right. I mean, no we one know will be- ever know because, yeah, like on the on the history books in Tarantino verse, like this was an operation carried out by the bastards, Operation Kino. Yeah. And it went sideways, but ultimately succeeded in assassinating Hitler and the top Nazi brass. No Shoshana anywhere. No Marcel anywhere. Mm hmm. And like, even if, uh, if Marcel did survive, nobody's going to believe him. <laughs> yeah, and like, okay, so um, Aldo and uh, oh, what's BJ Novak's character's name? No, I don't know. I don't know. Aldo and BJ Novak, they make it out alive. <laughs> he just plays himself. But they don't even know. They don't know yeah. that Shoshana did that. They have no idea. They weren't there. They didn't witness it. There is no one to tell Shoshana's story. Well, yeah, there's only two people. That would have known, and one of them's dead, and the other one will never be believed. Yeah, yeah. What, like Marcel is gonna? Yeah, he's a. Gonna believe him. Yeah, especially when there is, you know, this other true story of of Operation Kino, and it's like, what you're telling me that on the exact same night that we were carrying out this mission that we'd been planning for months. Your Jewish girlfriend decided to burn them alive? I don't think so. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I I never really thought about the tragedy of that before. Yeah, that's really heartbreaking. Oh, but Shoshana. but then you but then you see her just like cackling on the screen yeah, <laughs> as they're all burning, wins. you're like, "Yeah." <laughs> yeah, it's it's cathartic for sure. Well, yeah, and that's I think what makes this so powerful is is the catharsis um even to non-jewish people like nobody likes hitler (laughs) (laughs) no only just the worst people like Hitler. you can't make that statement as easily these days as you used to be able to (laughs) Uh, kind of a world are we living in right now Uh, but man and then of course it's all capped off by just the perfect sort of closure to this concept of performance because Londa has lined up for himself this perfect little situation where he's going to be remembered as this hero who betrayed the Nazis and, you know, led them, led the Allies to victory in Operation Kino and he gets to go and live in America and be comfortable the rest of his life uh, in Nantucket. And Aldo says, nope. You don't get to play that part. You don't get to have that happy ending. You don't get to to live in that world. I'm going to carve this swastika into your head so you can never, ever pretend you were anything else. Well, and like, he doesn't, Aldo doesn't know that, I mean, he probably does just from intel and stuff, but like, Crystal Waltz could have been just sort of stringing people along and not necessarily doing as, as bad of things 
as he could. Mm -hmm. But we know from seeing Shoshana's story that he's, like, pure evil. Yeah, well, and I have to imagine that Aldo may have heard of him because... Oh, yeah. I, uh... Monsieur Lapidite in the beginning knew who he was. Yeah. Like this French farmer was familiar with his career. And I, um, I imagine it's sort of Aldo's business to know these kinds of things. Yeah. So he probably mm-hmm. knew who he was. Well, and, and, and I think there's even a moment where they're doing that sort of debriefing scene where he's being interrogated. Um, yeah. Where. <laughs> and he's got the bag on his head and he headbutts him. <laughs> Well, actually, no, I think I it's, a scene, it's a scene earlier where they're like, I don't know, it's it's like a dark lit room and they're like at a desk. Yeah, no, that's the same scene. They, oh, they bring okay. in the two of them with oh, bags right. on their heads yeah. and Aldo but, headbutts. Um, <laughs> um, he says something about like, we're, we're like, the stories about us are way bigger than the truth. Yeah. And, and that yeah, goes he talks about it in the scene. Himself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so that's the reputation. Uh, yeah, yeah, and... exactly. And so he's, I think there he's trying to be like, you know what? I'm not a big, I'm not the worst guy in the world. You know, it's sort of stories, which we're just all playing awful. our parts. Yeah, we're... exactly. He's, he's, he's but, but to a man to like Aldo, it just, yeah, you know, it just doesn't matter. He's like, no, you're a Nazi. I don't, yep. I don't care what you want to tell me about who you are or what you want or what you've done or why you did it. You're a Nazi. Yeah. And Nazis get swastikas in their foreheads. <laughs> I can't remember. I love that. Too? No, no. They yeah. shoot the, the other guy, his assistant. Yeah. And, and Landa's like, you'll be shot for this. And Aldo's like, nah, I'll just be chewed out. I've been yeah. chewed out before. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and oddly enough, it, it's it, even though that scene is sort of, I don't know. I don't know if it's necessarily satisfying viewers by him getting his comeuppance. But like. That is probably the most graphic scene in the movie. When he's cutting into his yeah, forehead, it's so oh. gross! I can't. I have to like sort of look away half the t- or every time I watch it because it's just like, oh my goodness. <laughs> and it's super funny too because it just kind of reminds me of the ear scene in um, Reservoir Dogs and how everybody thinks that they remember seeing this ear get sawed off, but you don't. So it's funny mm-hmm. that in that movie, I mean, and I, I imagine it's a budgetary thing. Like yeah. Tarantino just did not have the money to do that effect of yeah. an ear being cut off. Um, but in Bastards, he's just like, now, now I will give it to you. Now you will see it <laughs> in all of its goriness. And that's the last <laughs> thing we see. Well, we, then we get the reverse shot of Aldo and um, BJ Novak Looking down at him, and he yeah. says, "Oh, Sarge, that's that. I think that's the best you've ever done." And you oh, know, yeah. Aldo says, "Yeah, this one's my masterpiece." <laughs> <laughs> Which and, uh, sort of ties into the the whole film about film um, performance thing. Well, yeah, a lot of people take that line as being directly from Tarantino about the film. Yeah, I mean that's pretty pretty, especially since it's the, <laughs> the last final line, line like... of the film is. This might be my masterpiece. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't necessarily disagree either. It's up there. I, I think a lot of people are just on the on the Pulp Fiction train. Yeah. Myself, I don't know that I could pick. I think my, I mean, honestly, like my true love is Jackie Brown. And I think that's just the hipster in me. And, yeah. and also, I just want to champion that movie because it's so undervalued, I think. Yeah. But I think my favorite Tarantino movie changes every day. <laughs> I think I think Inglorious Bastards is so uni- not not necessarily like entirely universally loved, but like it it got the acclaim that it deserved. It's successful. Yeah, well, it's successful, and like it, w- we we like it. Like every most people like it, and it, it's a good. Movie. I don't know anybody who doesn't like it, right? So I think I think I think the reason we might we might be like shying away saying it's a masterpiece is like we tend to not say that about popular movies. Yeah. But if if well, you think it, about like I don't know, it makes me think of Miyazaki, people would say that Spirited Away is his masterpiece and that was a huge success. Yeah, it was. Well, the interesting thing too is um apparently in an interview right around that time um that that Inglorious Bastards was coming out, um, someone was asking Tarantino, like, man, you've been just 
churning out movies lately in a way that you never have before. Um, and Tarantino said, you know, just completely straight faced. Well, I, I I'm trying to have a masterpiece out by the end of the decade. So, <laughs> like that was just his goal. Like yeah. he used that word masterpiece. Like he was like, no, that's what. Yeah, well, I have to make a lot of movies because I have to make the perfect one. <laughs> well, and he's probably not going into each movie like this is going to be like this. I'm going to try, but it, 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 that's sort of like a a joke you would probably have with yourself. Like, you know, I, I gotta try. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and I, and I I'd say that's certainly a reasonable choice as far as his his best film. It's I don't know. Wow. Well, I don't know. I just I and then it I just, second guess myself. On, There's... It, it just depends on how you how you define best, you know. True, I, I'd say that's probably what's tripping me up. It's his most Nazi-filled movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and if that is your benchmark for success, no, the benchmark is the is most, most. The benchmark is the most Nazi deaths. <laughs> most Nazi deaths. Yeah. That's a fair one. That's definitely a good indicator of a good movie. <laughs> it's a it's a it's an ingredient to a great movie. Oh <laughs> but I just I yeah, I got to talk a little bit more about Londa because that yeah. character honestly, I mean as much as I thought Vaults deserved the Academy Award for Django Unchained. I think Londa was an even better character than oh, yeah. Dr. I think, King. I think everyone agrees with that. Because... Do you know who won Best Supporting Actor that year? Because I don't. <laughs> I don't. Like, who beat that? Who did, who did that? Because, right? um, frankly... It was 2000, frankly, what, what I think... 2008? No, the movie came out in 2009. Uh, it, no, it came out in 2007. What? Yeah. No, that's not possible because there were posters for it when I was in England. You might be right. And that was I, after I graduated. I might be just forgetting. No. Um, no, he won it. Vaults? Yeah. In 2010. He, he did? Oh, for Inglourious well, Passes. good. <laughs> and then he won it again for Django. Well, good for him. <laughs> Good for him. But Londa is such a fascinating character. The way I, he just commands every scene that he's in. I think that will go down in history as one of the best performances of actors. His, it, it just yeah. Ever. It's excellent. Ever. That like that opening scene is just a masterclass in tension. And it yeah. would not have worked it, with a lesser actor. Absolutely. Or with an American actor. <laughs> Yes, though um, <laughs> Vault is not German; he is Austrian. Yeah, well, I mean, um, a lot of Nazis, I'm sure, were Austrian. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot, yeah, a lot of Nazis were a lot of things. Yeah. But uh, it's so funny, though, the way that he it was on. I believe Conan O'Brien um, Vault was explaining to Conan the difference between Germans and Austrians. Yeah, because. You know, because we don't Conan know. Was sort of asking him. Yeah, yeah. I was like, so you know, you're not extra German. You're Austrian. Like, what? What's the difference? And well, let's explain it. He says, Austrians are like a waltz. Germans are like a battleship. <laughs> 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 yeah, I love him a lot. He's just. I'm just sad that he was in a bad James Bond movie because I he could have been such a good Bond villain. He's been in some good movies. Have you seen Big Eyes? I haven't. Oh, it's terrifying. He's awful in it. Like not performance wise. Like character <laughs> is awful. He's super scary. It, he's he's yeah, and it's it's a really that's a movie that's definitely underrated. But also, I can understand why people wouldn't want to watch it. <laughs> I've been so iffy about uh, Burton for so long that I was like, it's, mm. it's very, it's very not Burton. It's probably his least, his least uh, Burton. Burton. Film. Like, yeah, exactly. Like you know, he has his style, <laughs> and it's, it's, yeah. it, it certainly know. has a couple winks and nods to his style. And I think the biggest wink is the is the the um, choice of 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 what it's about. 
because yeah, the, the subject matter. The, the paintings are very Burton, but they they I'm predate sure he him. Got a lot of inspiration from her art in the first place. Yeah, so um, I I it's excellent. And well, I'll, I'll put that one on the list. Uh, Amy Adams is great in it. Amy Adams is great. I like her. I know, me too. She's so cute. <laughs> that does it for today's episode. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to us on YouTube if you absolutely love us and like the video if you kind of just like us. Also, feel free to follow us on Twitter at LitMeritPod. And thanks to Jonathan Colton for the use of our theme song, Fraud, from his album, Artificial Heart. Until next time, remember, no, no guilty, guilty pleasures. pleasures.